My cheating wife asked for an open marriage to justify her affair with my best friend. I left them. My life with Sarah had always felt like a dream, a picture-perfect marriage that others would envy. We met in college during a philosophy lecture, where we bonded over discussions about the meaning of life and love. It was love at first sight, or so I thought. She had a magnetic energy, one that pulled me in like no one ever had before. We fell in love fast, moved in together before the end of our second year. And by the time we graduated, we were engaged. For the first 10 years of our marriage, everything seemed flawless. We built a life together, shared the same ambitions, and celebrated every milestone with joy. We both had thriving careers, Sarah as a creative director in an ad agency, and me as a project manager in tech. We were that couple that always looked happy. Our friends would joke that we were relationship goals, but something started to shift in our 15th year together. It was subtle at first. Sarah's late nights became more frequent. I chalked it up to her work being demanding, but a gut feeling began to gnaw at me. She was more distant, more reserved, and our intimate moments grew increasingly rare. I found myself staring at her across the dinner table, trying to find the woman I had married. Her laughter seemed hollow, her gaze unfocused. I tried talking to her. I asked if everything was okay, if something was bothering her. She'd brush it off, saying she was just stressed about work, that we needed to go on a vacation. But there was something else, something deeper, something I couldn't place. It was as if she had already checked out of our relationship emotionally, and I was the last one to notice. Then came the evening that shattered the illusion. We were sitting in the living room after dinner when Sarah, in a voice that seemed rehearsed, said she wanted to discuss something important. I've been thinking, she began, fiddling with her wine glass, about us, about our relationship. My heart skipped a beat. I knew this wasn't going to be good. What about it? I asked cautiously. She hesitated, then looked me directly in the eyes. What do you think about trying an open marriage? For a moment, I thought I'd misheard her. Sarah and I had never discussed anything remotely like that before. Our relationship had always been based on trust and monogamy. I couldn't fathom why she was bringing this up now. An open marriage? I repeated, my voice edged with disbelief. She nodded, but her eyes wouldn't meet mine. I just think, we've been together for so long. Maybe it's time to explore new experiences without giving up what we have. There was something in the way she said it, something that felt off. Her tone wasn't suggestive or curious. It was almost calculated, like she had already made up her mind, and this was just a formality. My stomach churned as I tried to process what was happening. I don't understand. Why now? I asked, my voice barely steady. She bit her lip and glanced away. I just think it could be good for both of us. We deserve to explore other connections. The more she talked, the more I realized this wasn't about spicing up our marriage. Something deeper was going on, something she wasn't telling me. And as much as I wanted to take her words at face value, a sickening suspicion began to creep into my mind. I didn't confront her right away. Instead, I told her I needed time to think, though my heart was already screaming the truth I didn't want to hear. Sarah wasn't suggesting an open marriage to explore. She was trying to justify something she was already doing. In the days following Sarah's proposition, I felt like I was living in a fog. Every moment I spent with her felt forced, tense, as though we were walking on eggshells around each other. The worst part was that I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that I was missing something obvious, something that was happening right under my nose. I decided to be patient to play along for the time being. I didn't want to jump to conclusions without proof. But the weight of suspicion was crushing me. Every time Sarah left for another late night at the office, I couldn't stop my mind from racing with thoughts of where she might really be. Then came the night I finally got my answer. It was a Friday, and Sarah had left earlier than usual for what she said was a client dinner. Something about the way she rushed out the door the way she avoided kissing me goodbye made me certain that she wasn't meeting a client. The apartment felt eerily quiet, and the more I thought about it, the more I needed answers. 
I felt like I was losing my mind imagining scenarios that made my stomach churn. I needed to know the truth. Her phone had been left on the kitchen counter. Normally, Sarah never left her phone out of sight, but tonight she had been in such a hurry that she must have forgotten. My hands shook as I picked it up. This wasn't me. This wasn't the man I wanted to be. But I had to know. Unlocking her phone, I scrolled through her messages, my heart pounding with every swipe. At first, there was nothing suspicious, just messages with coworkers, friends, and family. But then I found the thread I dreaded. Ryan. Ryan was my best friend, someone I had known since high school. He was the best man at our wedding, the person I trusted most outside of Sarah. My blood ran cold as I opened the conversation between them. The messages were explicit, filled with flirtatious banter, private jokes, and details of meetings that I had never known about. But what hit me the hardest was the familiarity. They had been seeing each other for months, maybe even longer. My best friend and my wife. The betrayal hit me like a freight train. The final blow came when I scrolled up to a message from Ryan, sent just a few days ago. That was amazing last night. I can't wait to see you again. Maybe we should tell him the truth. He deserves to know. I dropped the phone the weight of their betrayal crashing down on me. They had been planning this. Sarah's suggestion of an open marriage wasn't a spur-of-the-moment idea. It was her way of justifying what she had already done. She wanted to continue the affair without consequences. I sat there for what felt like hours, staring at the phone. My world had just collapsed, and the people I loved most were responsible. The next evening, I decided it was time to confront her. Sarah came home late, as usual, and seemed surprised to find me sitting at the kitchen table with a glass of whiskey. I watched her closely as she took off her coat, her eyes flickering with uncertainty when she noticed my demeanor. We need to talk, I said, my voice steady but cold. Sarah frowned, sensing something was off. About what? I took a long sip of whiskey, the burn doing little to dull the ache in my chest. About you and Ryan, her face turned ashen. For a moment, she stood frozen, as if the weight of the truth had finally caught up with her. Then she exhaled shakily, her shoulders slumping in defeat. I can explain, she started, but I cut her off. Don't. I've seen the messages. The room fell silent. I could hear the ticking of the kitchen clock, the distant hum of the refrigerator. It was strange how mundane the world seemed in the face of such a life-altering revelation. Tears welled up in Sarah's eyes but I felt no sympathy for her. I'm so sorry, she whispered, her voice cracking. I didn't mean for this to happen. I stared at her, feeling a mix of rage and disbelief. You didn't mean for this to happen? You've been sleeping with my best friend for months. You lied to me, Sarah. She tried to step closer, but I held up my hand, stopping her in her tracks. How long? She hesitated, then swallowed hard. A year, maybe longer. I felt sick. A whole year. For more than 12 months, the woman I had shared my life with, the woman I had trusted with everything, had been betraying me. And Ryan, the man who had stood beside me through thick and thin, who had toasted to our love at our wedding. He had been part of this too. Why? I asked, my voice trembling with emotion. Why am? Why do this to me? She wiped her tears away and looked down at the floor. I don't know. It just happened. We connected in a way that I didn't expect, and things spiraled from there. I clenched my fists, the urge to scream bubbling up inside me. What about us? What about everything we've built? Sarah's silence was deafening. I stood up, my chair scraping loudly against the floor. Do you love him? The words hung in the air for what felt like an eternity. Finally, she nodded. My heart shattered all over again. The following days were a blur. I packed a few things, told Sarah I was leaving, and walked out of the house we had shared for years. She didn't try to stop me. I think, in her own way, she knew that there was nothing left to save. The damage was too deep, the betrayal too profound. I stayed with an old college buddy for a while, someone who knew nothing about Ryan and Sarah. It was refreshing to be around someone who wasn't connected to the mess my life had become. I spent my days in a haze of anger and heartbreak, unsure of where to go next. But as the days turned into weeks, 
something began to shift. The pain was still there, but so was a strange sense of freedom. I no longer had to live under the weight of lies and betrayal. I had a chance to start over, to rebuild my life from the ground up. I threw myself into my work, staying late at the office and taking on new projects to keep my mind occupied. I started going to the gym again, something I hadn't done in years. Slowly but surely, I began to feel like myself again. Ryan tried to reach out a few times, sending me long-winded texts about how sorry he was, how he never meant for things to go this far. I deleted them without reading. He wasn't worth my time. Sarah, on the other hand, remained quiet. I heard through mutual friends that she and Ryan were now officially a couple, but I didn't care. They were no longer part of my life, and I was determined to keep it that way. A year had passed since the day I walked out of that house. In that time, I had traveled to places I'd only dreamed of visiting. Italy, New Zealand, Thailand. I'd reconnected with old passions, made new friends, and even started dating again. I wasn't looking for anything serious. But the idea of love didn't seem as impossible as it once had. One evening, as I stood on a cliff in Bali, watching the sun dip below the horizon, I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Peace. The betrayal that had once consumed me was now a distant memory, a scar that had healed over time. Sarah and Ryan had taken so much from me, but in the end, they had given me something far more valuable. Freedom. Freedom to live my life on my own terms, without the weight of lies or broken promises. As the sun disappeared into the ocean, I smiled to myself. Life was too short to hold on to people who didn't value you. And for the first time in years, I felt truly alive. Wife enables and spoils daughter, I leaves. I used to believe that family meant unity. That no matter what challenges arose, my wife, Emma, and I could face them together. We had been married for nearly 20 years. And for most of that time, we were a solid team. Or at least, that's what I thought. Our daughter, Lily, was the center of our world from the moment she was born. Emma was always the more indulgent parent, while I believed in setting limits, establishing discipline. We balanced each other out well in the beginning, but as Lily grew older, the balance shifted. By the time Lily turned 15, I began to notice how much Emma had started caving to our daughter's every whim. If Lily wanted the latest iPhone, Emma would buy it for her without question. If Lily wanted to stay out past curfew, Emma would cover for her, telling me not to be so strict. She's just a teenager, she'd say with a shrug. Let her enjoy her life. At first, I didn't think much of it. Emma had always been soft-hearted, and Lily was at that age where she was pushing boundaries. But as the years went on, it became clear that Lily had learned to manipulate Emma and my wife allowed it. She didn't just enable Lily, she encouraged her. And this was the root of our family's slow unraveling. By the time Lily was 18, she had transformed into someone I barely recognized. She was beautiful, smart, and had every opportunity in the world ahead of her. But she had become spoiled, entitled, and lazy. She expected everything to be handed to her on a silver platter, and when it wasn't, she would throw tantrums like a child. It was Emma who fed this behavior. Anytime I tried to lay down some ground rules, like asking Lily to get a part-time job or to take responsibility for her actions, Emma would swoop in like a protective mother hen. She stressed out about school, Emma would argue. Let her focus on her studies. There's plenty of time for her to work later. But the truth was Lily wasn't focused on school. She was more interested in partying with friends, going on shopping sprees with Emma's credit card, and ignoring her responsibilities. Every time I tried to step in, Emma undermined me, making me out to be the bad guy. She'd roll her eyes and call me too strict or old-fashioned. Why are you so hard on her? Emma would say, her voice filled with exasperation. She's a good kid. She deserves nice things. A good kid? I snapped one evening after Lily had blown through yet another thousand dollars on a shopping trip. She doesn't appreciate anything. 
She's rude, entitled, and refuses to take responsibility for her actions. And you keep enabling her. Emma's face flushed with anger. Don't you dare talk about her like that. She's our daughter. It's our job to support her, not tear her down. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Emma seemed blind to the fact that she was creating a monster. One who believed the world owed her everything. Things came to a head one evening when Lily stormed into the house. Furious over being unfairly denied entrance to a college she hadn't bothered applying herself to. She was furious, but not because she'd been rejected. No, she was mad because I had refused to hire a private tutor to do her applications for her. Emma, of course, was on her side. You should have helped her more, she exclaimed, glaring at me as if it was my fault that our daughter hadn't lifted a finger to secure her own future. Lily, you need to take responsibility for yourself, I said, trying to remain calm as our daughter screamed about how unfair life was. You're ruining my life, Lily shouted throwing her bag across the room in a fit of rage. Ruining your life? I scoffed, my patience wearing thin. You've been given everything you've ever asked for, and you don't even appreciate it. You refuse to put in the work, and now you're blaming everyone else for your failures. Lily looked at Emma, expecting her usual backup, and she got it. Emma stood between us, her face filled with fury. That's enough, Dan. She's upset. You're being too harsh. I shook my head in disbelief. Upset? She's spoiled rotten Emma. And you're the one who's allowed it. You've done nothing but coddle her. And now she's a grown woman who doesn't know how to stand on her own two feet. Emma didn't respond. She just turned away from me and wrapped her arms around Lily, comforting her as though she had been the victim of some great injustice. I stood there, watching as the two of them huddled together and I realized something that had been building up inside me for years. I couldn't do this anymore. In the days that followed, I withdrew from the house more and more. I spent longer hours at work, went on solo hikes in the mornings, anything to avoid the tension at home. I loved Emma, but I couldn't stand what she was doing to our daughter or to our marriage. She had chosen to indulge Lily at the expense of everything else, and I was left feeling like an outsider in my own home. The final straw came one afternoon when I returned home early from work. I found Lily lounging on the couch, watching TV, while Emma was in the kitchen cooking her favorite meal. Lily was supposed to be at her part-time job, something I had insisted she take to learn some responsibility, but she had quit weeks ago, and Emma hadn't bothered to tell me. Lily, what are you doing here? I asked, my voice strained. She glanced up lazily. I quit that stupid job. It was boring. I turned to Emma, who was avoiding my gaze. You knew about this? Emma finally looked at me, her expression defensive. She wasn't happy there. What's the point of forcing her to work a job she hates? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was the same daughter who refused to take responsibility for anything in her life. And now Emma was encouraging her to quit a job because it was boring? That's it, I said my voice barely above a whisper. I'm done. Emma blinked, confused. Done with what? With this, I said, gesturing around the room, with enabling her, with living in a house where my opinion doesn't matter. I can't keep doing this, Emma. Her face paled. You can't be serious. But I was. For the first time in years, I was completely serious. I had tried to make things work, to reason with Emma, to be a good father to a daughter who no longer respected me. But I couldn't fight this battle alone anymore. That night, I packed a suitcase and left the house. I didn't say goodbye to Lily. She didn't even seem to notice I was gone. Emma tried to stop me, but her words fell on deaf ears. I was done. Walking away from my family was the hardest decision I'd ever made, but it was also the most liberating. For the first time in years, I could breathe. I rented a small apartment downtown and began rebuilding my life, one step at a time. The first few weeks were difficult. I missed Emma, despite everything. I missed the woman I had fallen in love with. The one who had been my partner in all things before our parenting styles diverged so drastically. But I couldn't go back. 
not after what had happened. Lily, as far as I knew, continued living her life as if nothing had changed. She never called, never reached out. Emma sent a few messages, but they were half-hearted, more out of obligation than genuine desire to fix things. It hurt, but I realized that I couldn't fix them. They had to want to change for themselves. As the months passed, I found peace in my new routine. I threw myself into my work, made new friends, and even took up hobbies I'd neglected for years. I started going to therapy to deal with the guilt and the anger that had built up inside me for so long. Then one day, I got a call from Emma. Her voice was shaky, filled with the uncertainty I had heard so many times before. Lily's in trouble, she said, her words barely audible. I felt a surge of conflicting emotions. Part of me wanted to say, I told you so, but another part of me, the father who had always loved his daughter, knew that I couldn't turn my back on her completely. Tell me what happened, I said, my voice steady. And for the first time in what felt like forever, Emma didn't try to sugarcoat things. She didn't defend Lily's actions or make excuses. She told me everything. How Lily had dropped out of college, maxed out her credit cards, and was now on the verge of losing everything. I listened, my heart heavy. I didn't know what would happen next, but one thing was clear. Enabling and spoiling our daughter had come at a price. And now we all had to pay for it. 